thank you. Uh, oh, sorry. Good. <laughs> That's fine. Thank you. Yeah. Oh. Uh, I uh yes, on beginning. Uh, many thanks for inviting me. It's an honor for me to be with you because obviously I'm a great admirer of many of you, and especially it was such a great, uh, you know, surprise to see Gisela Hawkinson. I'm sure other people and uh, Lund University is a really wonderful place. And I would like just just like to mention two very close colleagues. Uh, one is Emeritus Professor Eva Chato Johansson, and the other one is the current professor of Turkic ling uh, languages, Birsel Karakoc, with whom I'm working almost on a day to day basis. So it's really great for me to uh, be giving this seminar. And uh, uh, you probably know. Uh, things I've been sort of working on, mostly uh, a lot of typological uh, issues, classifies there as a book from 2000, which I, I'm not sort of revising, it's a totally new book. Uh, and uh, evidentiality is a lot of things uh, on that, and uh, imperatives and commands, and uh, also serial verbs. But uh, in uh, uh, many ways, the sort of love of my life and my major dedication is to minority languages from the like real hotspots of the of linguistic diversity in the tropics, which exactly where I'm now, sort of in Kansas, it couldn't be more tropical than that. Uh, and especially the languages of uh, Arawa of the Arawak language family from uh, South America, and also languages from what used to be known as German New Guinea, now is known as the Sipic provinces in the northwest uh, of Papua New Guinea, which again, for you is far away and exotic. For us, it's still exotic, but it's just about around the corner. And so that's that's it. So if you want, we can start. Yes, please. Okay, great. So uh, I'm going to talk about something that, uh, uh, it's always a bit difficult to find a shared topic, but something that probably will touch uh, the hearts and the minds of all of us. Names, endangered names, poetics, power, and value. And before I start, I would like to respectfully acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we work and learn and pay respect to the First Nations peoples and their elders, past, present, and future. In this particular case, I think we're now on the Yudinji land. And you probably know that uh, Professor Dixon, my partner, did uh, foundational studies on the language which is no longer really spoken. Okay, we start. Now, the major issue in today's world is the impending endangerment of languages, the cultures they reflect and societies within which they were, are, or were, or used to be spoken. And let's say if there are five, uh, four to 5,000 languages across the world, more than half are no longer being learned by children, so they are endangered. Original languages are being replaced by the dominant national languages, you name it, English, Spanish, Portuguese, Russian, Mandarin, Chinese, Indonesian. Australia, of course, where we are, Amazonia and New Guinea are the cases in point. And language loss and concomitant loss of social practices and tradition are a consequence of colonial expansion and basically a natural disaster, natural. Uh, if you know uh, anything, you probably do, because you are the land of sort of where Greta Thunwald made such a lovely, wonderful imprint. What's happening to Northern Australia? Uh, we have one of the biggest tragedy, most people say, the Great Barrier Reef, which used to be like this, healthy Great Barrier Reef. You can see turtles swimming around, lovely colors. And now as a result of climate change, it's bleaching, bleaching, bleaching. Very soon, it probably will become like a black and white photograph. And so depletion and ultimate loss of diversity of languages is a bit like that. It's sort of losing color. Everyone will become the same in black and white photograph. And so we're facing with, uh, faced with a loss of ways of expressing people's identities, heritage, and magic poetic powers. And again, Bob Dixon formulated it quite sort of hard, in a heartbreaking manner as the language is retreating, contracting, as it gradually falls into disuse. He was actually talking about the Yidinji language. Uh, this involves loss of words and patterns with special qualities, magical and protective. People are at a loss, and this, of course, affects their well-being in its many facets. And personal names with their special powers are a case in point. So this takes us to my topic. What I'm going to do in this talk, I'd like to, talk, to focus on personal names, their linguistic features a little bit, 
and social and cultural significance and what is happening to them, especially introducing some of the marvels of minority languages and what one can learn through first-hand immersion fieldwork in rather remote locations. You'll probably see how remote they are. So, preamble, what's in the name? Well, speakers, as we know, often conceive of their languages in terms of lexicon, putting primary value on the knowledge of words, which of course is an offense to us grammarians, but you'll see in a minute, not so much. Some words are simply more valuable than others. They entail power, contain the secret of survival. So this is what personal names across cultures are good for. And uh, as Alexander Durante, one of the sort of probably the best known linguistic anthropologist, really a star, says the symbolic power of names, proper names have indexical relations to places, people, events, meaning narratives about the past or the future. And as Paul Kroskriti also said very in a nifty way, they display linguistic intricacy and cultural complexity. And uh, uh, personal names uh, derived from names of sort of like people's clan lands, tell people's histories, like there was a paper by Nick Evans on the Kyadel of Northern Australia. All these is embedded in personal names and what happens if they are endangered, nothing good. Anyway, knowing and revealing the name may imply having power over its bearer. So let's get back to sort of our kind of, so shall we say you, you're a, European heritage. The Egyptian goddess Isis could heal the sun god Ra only after she had learned his real name, which makes sense. You will see how it makes sense in the South American context because names have healing powers. But upon learning his true name, what happened? She acquired the powers of Ra and became his equal, which is great for female, ident female equality at that point in time in ancient Egypt, but wasn't great for Ra. Don't think he appreciated it. And name taboos and restrictions on mentioning people's names are uh, all over the world, I mark of respect. In many societies across Australia, Africa, New Guinea, Amazonia, the name of a recently deceased person or an in-law cannot be pronounced, or even a word which sounds similar to that name. There's the practice called Klonipe Mandinguni and the Posa of Southern Africa, it's quite well known. And uh, names um, can be token of status and indicators of the position in the society. So let's just go to Africa for a change, also a place of huge linguistic diversity. In traditional Igbo, which is one of the largest languages of Nigeria, you find lots of names containing the form kwe. That goes back to the verb kwe, agree, permit, consent, allow, obey. And this verb, especially the notion of, uh, well, I don't speak Igbo, but okwo kwe with, it, with tones, is significant in the Igbo traditional cultures because they would believe that their existence and survival prosperity depends on consent, on sort of agreement between different groups. And this belief is mirrored by numerous names, which contain kwe. It's a wonderful article by Onukawa in Anthropological Linguistics. There is a list of reference at the end. Names are given by the father as full sentences, then they're shortened. The father determines the shortening, but the kwe part remains. These names are almost prayers or wishes that the necessary social and supernatural powers should agree to the survival and the prosperity of the bear. Look at that. So kwe names, like igbo kwe, igbo kwe, let the igbo people agree the importance of a group over an individual. Now, agbara kwe, let the deities agree, or accumulations of virtues such as prosperity. Akunang kwe, let father's acquisitions agree. So this name, Akunakwe, is traditionally given to father's beloved male child, expressing the, the desire that the inheritance of the acquisition should favor the bearer at the expense of all the other children. So giving a person a right name assures the right future. A name gives you status and also peace of mind that you're building. Now, at the same time, what do we see? With the advent of new Western practices and values, the names and naming system, uh, systems become endangered, with them, what goes with them is part of indigenous knowledge, history, identity. This is what's happening to the Igbo people, we said the end. And protective powers of names actually make them very important for well-being and survival. However, this does not always happen. So personal names now. The special status of personal names is also mirrored by their grammatic, special grammatical features. 
In many languages, personal names form a special grammatical subclass of nouns. Uh, there is a book which I wrote called The Art of Grammar. Mm, uh, it's a picture by my favorite Polish painter Malevich. So you can see what it looks like. If you want a copy, I can send you a copy by internet. Personal names may have special phonological features. For instance, in Hua, a uh, language described by John Heyman, whom you, I'm sure you know, his studies of sarcasm and Khmer and various other things, they end in a vowel followed by glottal stop. So you hear glottal stop at the end of the word, you know it's a personal name. Personal names often form associative plurals. It's basically like in English, uh, the Smiths. It means, uh, doesn't mean many Smiths. It, means Smith and whoever is with them. So for instance, there comes John Smith and his wife, Penny Brown, and they can call, be called the Smiths. She's not Smith. In uh, this part of the world in Australia where I live, people would say Smith and them. So that's your associated plural here. But it is a, a feature of personal names, or they may be the only nouns in the language to have a word gender markers. This is what we will see in Manambu uh, from Papua New Guinea. And so personal names and naming systems play a very special role across traditional minorities, minority languages and cultures. Their erosion goes together with the bleaching of traditional knowledge. Actually, we'll have, and you, you will see examples, adverse consequences for how people feel. And now let's just jump to the two areas of my firsthand experience, Amazonia and New Guinea, which happen to be the loci of extreme linguistic diversity. The healing names, number two. We'll now undertake a virtual trip to the Valpes area in Northwest Amazonia. This is known one of the, as one of the world's most multilingual regions, spans adjacent regions of Brazil and Colombia. I worked in Brazil, so I'm telling you about Brazil. The area is known for its multilingual exogamy. You have to marry someone who speaks a different language. In actual fact, what you, who you marry is someone whose father belongs to a different group, speaking a different language different from your own father, because inheritance and sort of identity is strictly patrilineal. And so for these people saying mother language, you just look at you, it's one of these white people's stupid things. People do not care about mother's language at all. They identify with father's language. And so people traditionally used to speak, or some, many still do, numerous local languages, fathers and mothers and neighbors, Plus national languages, Spanish in Colombia, Portuguese in Brazil, these uh, areas on the border both. The multilingualism is on the way, in, at least in Brazil, because of Silesian missionaries who did their best to condemn the traditional practices as pagan, and they imposed just one numerically largest language. And so now Tucano is the major language, other indigenous languages are endangered, but we're trying our best to sort of at least document them. So let's get to uh, the language I'm going to talk about. We're talking about this area. You can see it looks like a dog's head and actually it's called dog's head. Tariana is spoken around here, dog's head, by mm. fewer than about 100 people. And uh, uh, they live in Brazil, but of course they cross Colombia, to Colombia if they want to vote to get a free t-shirt, stuff like that. And this is uh, what traveling to the Tariana speaking areas look like. I don't know if you can recognize me, but rest assured that I'm here. Uh, Tariana, what's sort of interesting about it, it's the only language from the Arawak family spoken only on the Brazilian side. Other languages are Tucano, and the language is spoken in two villages. And nowadays, very few people acquire Tariana as their first language. And in the situation, people are aware of this language obsolescence. Every scrap of knowledge is valuable, especially that which has healing power, right? Now, what about names? Each Tariana has a few names. How come? For one, Silesian missionaries have been firmly established in the area ever since 1925. Every Tariana is a practic uh, practicing Catholic. I had to say it was Catholic. Otherwise, it's just I would be a kind of regio. Everyone was baptized and given a Portuguese name and the family name. Two villages, so members of one village are Brito, the other one is Muniz. And uh, the given names of Portuguese origin, I used to refer to people when they're absent, hardly ever to address them. And basically what you use like in uh, every um, uh, small community or every uh, traditional minority, you use kinship, kinship terms. Uh, uh, when you address people. This is a mark of respect, otherwise it's disrespect. 
So, three types of names. We have your Christian or baptismal names. Most of these are usually, usually shortened. And uh, some shortenings are predictable. Some are sort of not totally, but still. You have Jovino, you'll see him, Jovi, Rafael, Rafa, Jacinto, Jaci, Leonardo, Leo, or Leona, Olivia, Oli, not, not Olive. Olivia. Every man, but not a woman, used to have a nickname, sometimes a little bit kind of naughty, pejorative, known as Napecaroni uh, Pepitana, literally sort of playful name. Now, for those of you who know Portuguese, it's actually quite funny. The word pecaro is a, a, the root, is a loan from Portuguese word for sin. So that's how they took Silesian seriously. So sin is like a playful thing to do. Now, these nicknames are typically names of animals, insects. Some are offensive, so I don't know the name of my adopted father because I was adopted into the community. Names for younger speakers, Tapia, you know, Tapia probably have Tapia in London, Stockholm, in the mm, uh, zoological gardens. It's beautiful, it's a huge nose, beautiful animal. So it's Rafael Brito, then uh, Jacinto Brito is called Rat's Tail, Hirisipi. Paichi is for the latest, Melbri to one of the best speakers, and on it goes. Capato, armored catfish for Juvino. He doesn't like it, but somebody told me. <laughs> so, and then, number three, all the Italian men and women have a further set of names, which are called uh, names of blessing, translated as na names of blessing. Paniapanipi Pitana, blessing name, or Napianipe Pitana, name of breathing. And that you will see why they're called that, because uh, to bless someone used to breathe on their wounds or something. You will we'll get it. So we have Jovino Brito, who is also known as Jovi for short, Tapato as armored catfish. He doesn't like it. What's What they have in common, I don't know. And also his blessing name, Kuda. Rafael Brito, who is a local politician, and of course, being a local politician, he is the object of total, you know, people hate him because he is a local politician. He's known as Rafa. He's also known as a tapia, for some reason, Hema. And Serev Hale is his blessing name. Olivia is known as uh, Oli for short. Uh, she has no nickname because she's a woman. Her blessing name is a female duck, Kumataro. By the way, this is our sort of kitchen in the village. So you can see it's interesting place. So the blessing names are not secret. People do not really reveal them to outsiders. I was encouraged to publish the list of traditional names, and I did. And why people said, insisted that I include them in the book, so that our children should know. The Tariana are dismissive of the older Tariana, who do not know their blessing names. So as for me, I was also, well, I was, I'm considered Tariana woman, Tariya Sado. I was given a name, also, a name, also Kumatharo, a sort of female duck. And Jovino, remember uh, the sort of shish, said that it was a good name for me because I, I fly so much, would be a joke. And also his older brother said, well, this name will protect you because I was with my son now and again. Protect you all, he said. Uh, the blessing names are given to children when they reach the age of about three, which means that they were not going to die, basically. Uh, child, uh, child mortality used to be very high. It's a bit less now, but still. They are not used to address people, not to talk about them normally, right? Their main function, function is for spells and blessings, especially when a person gets sick. So what's the use of a blessing name? Okay, let me first tell you uh, these sort of uh, hierarchies, a few words about the hierarchy of shamans. There was a low, uh, there were about six steps. The low grade, Sakaka, to the higher grade, uh, Wahivo Marieri. So Sakaka could only, uh, sort of heal minor wounds and uh, uh, give people aphrodisiac, an aphrodisiac type stuff. Uh, the highest grade no longer exists because it's somebody who travels at night, becomes a jaguar, all sorts of stories. Now, with the advent of Silesian missionaries, the procedures of training shamans have been interrupted. They haven't been stopped by law, unlike in, in Papua New Guinea, but it just stopped being uh, passed on. Among the older Tarian, uh, in the uh, older men have the capacities of the sort of lower shaman. And the ritual involves invoking the powers of jungle spirits, asking to help uh, the sufferer. This is where the names come in. And the sufferer is referred to by the blessing name. And the sakaka, the shaman, always a man, 
It's different from Sayyana Mami, where they used to be shamans, women, the book about that. Breathe so the shaman breathes on the afflicted body part, intoning a spell with multiple mentions of the name, blessing name of the patient. It's a sort of way of invoking the power of a healing spirit, as I was told. And uh, that the blessing names are names of breathing, right? It reflects the way in which the blessing is done. And I uh, actually underwent that. I'm not an anthropologist, but it was it was just so it just happened. I was trying to understand what Kanjido, the late Kanjido Brito, was saying when he was breathing. But I could not make anything other out other than my blessing name. So that's fine. What he, here's what he looks like. You can see Jesus here. So they are all practicing Catholics. Things just live together. And so what's happening now? Uh, well, you know, most of the children of the Italian speakers don't know their blessing names or unsure. None of them speaks the language, but they wanted to know uh, their own blessing names. And there is a list in my book, uh, Tariana Texts and Cultural Context. They were so happy to see them. It was a very interesting reaction. The late Brasiliano's eldest son, Rosimar, explained and uh, just exclaimed, Oh my God, he said, No, Deus, my name is Turi. I went to see a shaman, a Pasha, because there was always a shaman in the hospital in Amazonia, believe it or not. I was sick. He used another name. So it didn't work. There's no pegola. It didn't catch. The, the treatment didn't take, didn't work. Here he is. He's completely recovered, playing football here. So with the passing of Kenjido and his, a number of his elder son, his next in line son, Julino, you've seen them, Huda, has acquired the powers of a sort of minor shaman. He's incredibly competent, well, on WhatsApp almost every day, exchanging sort of, well, I just admire his proficiency in the language. But he's not sure of his knowledge of names. Well, here he is. This is Juvin. This is his sons. And so he says, he sent me a message saying, well, names of the children, the late Elio, I know it's Kumada, Josimar, Ipheko Menaka, Josivaldo, Menaka, Ipheko. He knows that by the sequencing of names, if you want, I can tell you later about it. It should be one or the other, but which one? Josefran Kuda and ja Jani, Jane Jani, Kumataro. Okay, so I sort of told him what my book said. My book said, I have Menaka, so he took it. So for the Tariana, the power of names is still there, very strong, even if the language is on the way out. The healing power of names remains, even if the language is used in few and few spheres. And the book where the names are listed is in English. They don't read English, but they are literate. And so this book all of a sudden acquire, has acquired certain value. Okay, and so now let's just jump around and go straight to New Guinea, which is far away, but it's okay. We can handle it via Zoom. What about New Guinea? People say between 820 and uh, 820, 840, very different vernacular languages known as Tokples are spoken in on the New Guinea island, which is divided into sort of Papuan part and Papua New Guinea, which is a country on its own. Within, uh, at least within Papua New Guinea, they belong to at least 60 language families, which are incredibly different, as English, I'd say, and Arabic. And here it is, so where we're going is about here. West Sipic, is Sipic which used to be German, but up to here was like German. Uh, and across the island of New Guinea, personal names are tokens of relationship with other community members, names owned by clan, their own, their tantamount to other valuable belongings. And if you appropriate someone else's name, this will be, can be disputed in the name debate. This is a feature of a number of groups in the Sipic area. And also names play a rather important part in poetic traditions. And of course, I will uh, focus on the group I know best. Uh, I also was adopted there, Manambu in the Sipic region. The mosaic of the Sipic region. So my God, why did you include that? It just, you can't understand anything. Well, this is why, because it's really a total mosaic where you lose yourself in it. It's, it's really very, very hard. It's names, villages. We still don't know how many languages, many languages there are. So. Mosaic. And one uh, of the uh, big sort of languages of this mosaic is Manambu. Here it is. About 3,000 people. For us, it's huge, a huge language. In Africa, they would laugh at me. It's a huge language. 
five villages, the main village is called Avatip. It's called basically the, the name translates as the village of the Baona foundational village. The Marambu are close linguistic relatives, but they don't like each other. Of the Yatmo, who were made famous by Gregory Bateson and partly Margaret Mead in sort of like the 30s and then 1968. And this is what the village looks like. You can see it's sort of pretty civilized, very clean. No, it's not clean because necessarily because people want to be clean. The excuse for being clean is to not to attract evil spirits. So, but it looks great, right? The importance of personal names is uh, reflected in the major anthropological study, which is called Stealing People's Names by Simon Harrison. Simon Harrison's book starts with a story about Adam, and why not? So there was a missionary who arrived and started right to the village to uh, about 50, maybe about 40s, 1940s, decided to you know, turn them to Christianity. They started telling the Manambu men about the first man, Adam, and then one of the men said, what? You stole our name, Adam is our name. So the missionary left. Doesn't mean that there is no Christianity. They have six denominations, but they didn't start until early 60s. So they had a bit of sort of a break from Christianity because of that. And personal names are key in the culture and every day life of many peoples of the that, CP, that part of the Sipic area, the Manambu especially. They are the source of power and tokens of personal wealth. One's claim of land ownership is traditionally linked to knowledge of names of people, landmarks, and objects associated with the different clans. So if I want to claim a mountain, I will say, well, 14 generations ago, there was such and such man, and he's my great, great he's my ancestor. There's no word for great, 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 great grandfather. So Simon Harrison probably was right. Estimate back, and uh, he did his field work in the late 80s. Estimated that an initiated man, knowledgeable man in the middle of the area, be it Manambu Yatmo, would know thousands of names. He's probably right. And that resonates with Gregory Bateson, who was a very talented anthropologist. Uh, estimate that an erudite Yatmo man would carry in his head between 10 and 20,000 names, which is uh, kind of incredible, but in cultures with no traditional literacy before we sort of start stopped uh, well before we started relying on written world you know google computer whatever uh, you really have to have a good memory so they did many still do personal names are a very special subclass of nouns because uh, for most nouns number is not marked overtly uh, it's expressed via agreement so only now whether it's a uh, uh, single plural or dual by the form of the modifier or the verb now, personal names are different. They have a special number, uh, which is always marked overtly, which is associated with plural. So for instance, Leo, my uncle Leo came with his family and it was referred to as Leumber, Leo and them, Leo and his family, or the Leos, if you want. And also gender, Manambu is very gender-centered, is feminine and masculine. It's marked overtly. You will only know what gender the, the, uh, the noun is, by agreement, but personal names have gender sensitive derivation suffixes. You hear a name, you always know it's female or male. Like King Man uh, will be feminine, King Dimi, Dimi is always masculine. And there are the special grammatical features of those names. That's some of them are listed in my grammar of Manambu. You can see what the village looks like. Uh, now, the erosion of traditional practices. Again, we start this as. Our boss uh, himself, a descendant of Dirbul people, says that this cause of deficit. Full initiation no longer occurs. So people do not have a sort of full knowledge of the ancestors. Uh, why? Well, because uh, the full initiation, for one thing, used to involve uh, headhunting and homicide. The Australian authorities came in. In the 30s, they said, we'll just stop it. Well, they stopped it, but anyway, it didn't stop immediately. All the people send uh, still now a lot of names, but, uh, and the clans, uh, they are uh, the property of, because each clan owns a name. Names are still key to status and wealth, but younger people know kind of less and less. So look at this uh, very sort of, I don't know, to me it's a very sad picture. Mm, Pauline, you are, look at that. Pauline, you are named Luma Lucky. I missed out her Catholic name because she didn't like it. Start again. Pauline, you are named Agnes Lumalaki, was uh, my sort of initiator into the Manabu culture, my main older sister, and a remarkable woman in every way. 
and her status was very high. It was reflected in, it is reflected in the multiplicity on her name, of her names. Shall I read them out to you? Now, not all the names are listed here, why? Because additional names were given to her by her maternal relatives while she was alive, so there were more. And she gave me a name, Yamamara Tak, with a very strong name of an ancestral totemic woman from her paternal subclan. She's very useful because we, like we travel on a river to get to another village or to get anywhere. And uh, I sit in this canoe and somebody shouts to my, uh, to the person who's driving, why do you have a white woman there? What's white woman doing there? And the answer, she's not a white woman. I'm not a white woman. She's a Nyam, she's Nyamamara Tak. Oh, Nyamamara Tak, tell me, you know, I'm just such and such. I'm sitting there in the sort of middle of the canoe, middle of the river, trying to find that, understand what relation he is to me or she and uh, how I should address them because God forbid I make a mistake. Then the one who is the driver of the canoe corrects me, thank goodness. So uh, uh, names, uh, uh, so that's the, uh, that's Polian status. Now, uh, let me tell you uh, something about the Manambu so that we could uh, be, as people say, on the same page with regard to how these names operate. The Manambu divided into three exogamous clan groups Clan allegiance, again, is inherited from one's father. Every clan has a number of subclans, and every subclan uh, owns a set of names. And the all the more names you know, the wealthier you are. Because again, ownership of a piece of land can be proved that this proved on the basis of knowing the ancestors who lived there. And competent orators would know names more than 14 generations back. That's what they said to me. Names belonging to a clan can be recognized by their form as they contain names of totems. So of the clan I belong to, uh, many names of that belongs with you are, you, well, you are, the term for green snail shell, which is a totem of the clan. So Pauline is your name, Simon Harrison, the anthropologist, is your assassin. Pauline's brother, former government minister, Joel, uh, is your fellow, and on it goes. And stealing people's names, uh, Simon Harrison's book, Using a name which belongs to a different clan or subclan is like theft. But somebody disputes, it's my own name. The missionary couldn't do it, but the Manabu people know what they're doing. When this happens, elders organize a name debate called Sagi, with orators from each subclan arguing for the subclan's totemic ownership of the name. I witnessed one in uh, 2004. The object of dispute between the two clans of the same subclan group was the name Kunginumbuk. And this name and its feminine equivalent, Kunginumbukumbuk, was won by the, uh, one of the subclans, Wangao. The other subclan was actually awarded another name, Kungindimi, masculine, you remember this in Dimi, and its female counterpart, Kunginumbuk, as a compensation. So there was a lot of negotiation. I was allowed to sit in the audience and said, well, you know, she's, she's not really a woman, she's a white woman. So for that, I was a white woman. I could take pictures, here's some pictures. It's really quite spectacular. This man who is uh, no longer uh, uh, with us uh, was standing and swinging himself with a piece of beautiful croton and reciting the names. And here is his opponent doing the same. And then people were dancing and uh, uh, beating the drum. We get to that drum. Uh, and women, you see, you can see women and children were at the back, like real women. So Pauline Lucky was a real woman, I wasn't. But that's all right, we've got the pictures now. Uh, I did record uh, videos where a bit of a problem, so I didn't take uh, uh, record any videos. So now, there is a difference between pattern names and matron names. The first given name is given by the father. It's called the main name or the bone name or the first name. And throughout their, uh, their life, uh, a child would receive many more names, non-main names given by the fa uh, father's family or matrilineal relatives. Maternal uncle is a very important relation. And these, uh, if a person is in trouble or is uh, in mourning, then a maternal relative steps in and gives them a name. So maternal names protect the person while they're alive. This is why it's important to know them. And they die when the person dies, which is why we don't know all of uh, Pauline's uh, maternal names. Paternal names are the ones that stay with them after their death. They're like their spirit in a way. So they have different functions. 
And uh, interestingly, many people don't remember it anymore. One of my older brothers, uh, Pauline's husband, actually, he's a bit older, about two years older than five years, three to four years older than me, said that, look, you know, you, if you use a macho name, it's kind of nicer. So he doesn't really relate to the fact that it's a different type of name with different function, but he feels that it's nicer. And, uh, but the problem is that many children no longer remember their names, let alone names belonging uh, to their clans. They have no matching names. So it is hard life for everyone. Now, what are the names used in? Well, all names that the person had are recited at mortuary festivals. They're an integral part of Ngrakundi, which is morning songs, and also lament about marriages. And uh, uh, the knowledge of how to compose the songs is basically on the way out. But, well, we'll see uh, the names are still used uh, other ways. But this is a type of thing that the names were very important in. But even now, in a Catholic eulogy about a young man, man tragically killed on the streets of Madang, where they're studying, he was studying. So beware when you go to any of these places. Just don't walk in the streets if you don't have to. His father listed all his Manambu names. So it is, there is still a sort of like necessity to have these names. And only a few knowledgeable people uh, would know the full set of names. The allegiance of some names may be deb debatable. And this creates a problem for linguists as dictionary makers. How do we do a full dictionary? Do we list all the names? What if we're accused of misappropriating names? We're in trouble. So maybe uh, we will never complete our Manambu dictionary because it's, uh, we don't want to be in trouble. Anyway, it's a different question. And so, uh, as I said, the genres of songs of old marriages and morning songs used to involve a list of names. But the problem is that speakers' competence in composing songs of any genre is rapidly dwindling. dwindling. There used to be these two types, uh, uh, morning songs and folk marriages, which I actually recorded quite a lot of, but the folk marriages one I can't play because, well, it was still alive, Ella Flint summoned. And the structure of these songs was quite remarkable. Each of them used to consist of two stanzas. One was one side, called one side up, a sentence in, uh, interspersed with uh, totemic address forms and names, many of which come from Yatmo, a related language. And the second stanza will be again rephrasing the same thing in a, in a shadow register. Again, lots of loan words from Yatmo. This is the only place where you have loan words from Yatmo because the two groups sort of really are slightly opposed to each other. Here is uh, one of the last experts in morning songs, Grakundi. Her name is Walenu. She's now about 90, but she's fine. She's alive. So the loss that we have is sort of, well, we've heard about it before. As Tony Woodbury wrote in 1998, stylistic, rhetorical, expressive loss often accompanies partial language obsolescence in the situation of language shift. And obsolescence of a ritual register is just part of the ongoing language bleaching and culture change, which accompanies the partial shift to Tokpisin, the lingua franca of the area, which is a Creole sort of it's very it's it's fun, it's a fun language, it's not mutually intelligible with English, but it's not as complex as Manambu. Hope people forgive me. And those linguistic consequences are quite drastic because formerly you had a sort of bilingualism realized in an unusual kind of diglossia. Yatmul forms were part of a ritual register, it's gone. So a few Yatmul songs are, are appear now and again. So, some are identified, but not all, by speakers as being originally Yatmul. So this kind of register and with it diglossia is going. Well, uh, why so? Well, the Yatmul elements, many of them, were restricted to spheres where there was traditional ritual exchange between the Yatmul, who were ritual and the bigger, bigger group, more powerful, trading words and other items to do with exchange of spiritual valuables, which were same as monetary riches, exchange of sacred objects. This is how they got into the ritual register. Now the ritual register is gone, is going, and so is uh, the remainder of this multilingualism, and so are the loan words which is quite sort of interesting and a bit bad. Now, all song genres and also the knowledge of names and gene genealogies are on the way out. And so uh, women under 60 and even many of the older women do not have enough knowledge to perform 
uh, a morning song. So it was very interesting. Well, it was a bit tragic. Again, we were sitting in the house and there was a funerary procession. So a little boy died. And uh, then Kamim Bao, who was my, uh, well, just sitting next to me in her early 60s, said, ah, these people don't know how to sing. They sing men's fashion. Like, this is how they sang. Oh, 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 a high-pitched whining sound, men fashion. fashion. Normally, whatever men do is kind of high quality than what women do. That was the opposite, which is rather interesting. And, uh, uh, well, the way it was referred to is Ndungar or Kapangar, just crying nothing, crying for nothing. The multidimensional tapestry of their elaborate Manabu culture and just ways of doing things is eroding. And with this, the remainder of traditionally multilingual society. Plus, what we have on top of that, of course, is nationalization of names, introduction of identity cards, uh, birth certificates, various other documents. So you really have to have one name, don't have more than one, please, because nobody will understand you. As a result, we have the depletion of knowledge and people's roots, not really very sad. And now, let me tell you something about exceptional names, which are found outside New Guinea, but in New Guinea, they proliferate. Uh, people call them non-phonemic names, tunes, whistles, and drum beats, a, person, a prominent mark of person's identity across New Guinea. Just for names, having them just for names uh, is quite unusual only uh, like little documented in other parts of the world. They've been documented by, uh, for the Omotic speakers or speaking Oida in Southern Ethiopia. And the person who documented them was, uh, is uh, uh, Dr. Azabamha from herself, a uh, uh, speaker of Walaita uh, from Ethiopia. So uh, uh, these names are called uh, Moise among the Oida. Every member of the community has a proper name like uh, uh, Kasaba, I think you will hear, and the Moise name tune. A proper name can simultaneously be used to refer to different people. Two or more living people cannot share the same uh, whistle name. And Moise, I'm more reliable personal identifier than a normal sort of personal phonemic proper name that you get in your passport. They are typically whistled by blowing air between two fingers of a hand held against the mouse while the airstream is modified by the movement of the fingers of that hand, which means nothing to you. And this is what it looks like. And now tell me if you can, I hope you can hear it. Well, this is absolutely unique to this man, Banura. Did you hear it? Yes. Good. I heard it. Yes. Just the beginning. Yes, yes. Okay, you want to hear it again? Yes. All right. I think we didn't hear all of it. Okay, we can do it again. That's fine. That's what. The, that's all there was. No. Oh, now we heard it. No. Yeah. Yeah, so now you know how to call, uh, call Binura if you meet him somewhere. You go to him. <laughs> but there is a link, and you, I think, can download it from that link. Yeah. There was an, an article about that. So Moise and Reigns, according to one consultant, uh, the whistling of different people differs as their fingerprint would differ, fingerprints would differ. And every person knows their Moise. They're still used to summon people who greet them. But the spheres of, you, of their use are shrinking until hunting, hunting was outlawed in the 1970s in Ethiopia. Until then, Moise were used to assemble people for hunting. Now, with the expansion of Protestant and Pentecostal, especially faiths among the Oida, the use of Mo uh, Moise in funeral context has become has uh, started eroding, and probably these practices were considered heretic. So you have to use your proper names and stick with them. But some young people are creative. One young man apparently used, used his deceased father's Moise as a mobile ringtone, because <laughs> there are no restrictions on using them uh, for deceased people. So this will some, is something we'll get to. Across New Guinea, whistle names and names communicated with sleep gongs, we'll get to it in a second, are absolutely just preeminent. Uh, name tunes uh, are often used as uh, or drum beats or whistling sequences to identify a person or their clan. 
And some of them are double duty as a means of uh, identification of a person or N as a mean of means of identifying their clan allegiance. There is, this is a feature of Europe, of, uh, Europe North, quite a big group of, uh, in, in um, Morobe province, from Finisterre. They sang Ham the Whistle, but I don't have any recordings. There are special person specific whistle tune among the Dom and Chimbu province, very dangerous place to go to, but yeah, but they exist. And also in the Sipic region that we've seen this mosaic. There was a very nice description of a close set of Isian name whistles for the Mehek. Uh, every, uh, which is uh, uh, West Sipic province of Sundown, every given name had its unique Isi correspondence with some of them, like a whistle. And a few further name melodies are sung on special occasions. So it's all a whole sort of gives you a whole new perspective on what language is like. Most people still know their name whistle, but fewer and fewer people know other people's whistle. The unusual practice is on the way. This is what people look like uh, on a sort of like a dance. Now, other groups in the neighboring Isipic province used to use drum beats. Well, this is your sort of slit gong. Uh, to identify a clan and the family. According to some people, even as individual names, I heard this practice described for the Yalago that I'm working with now and other their neighbors, but I've never heard it being performed because, well, these people are really very devout Christians. And uh, maybe they just uh, do not like those things because they're not quite exactly what the church would tell them to. I didn't know why I don't ask such questions, but look what a beauty. But the recurrence of non phonemic names of, across New Guinea, why? Maybe it's associated with the features of the landscape, mountains and swamps, and necessity of long distance communication across uh, natural uh, uh, barriers, but it seems to be kind of going. So, Let's get to the sad part, the changing picture. The advent of colonial dominance across the island of New Guinea has brought about changes in naming system. Many people have a first name of colonial origin and uh, they may still have some traditional names which are referred to as village name or name belong place. Name belong place in Tokpisan. In many cultures, uh, though Christian names are not valued in the same way as traditional names. I believe they have no power. Some people don't like using them. Nevertheless, many young people, that's all they know. And uh, traditional names of one fa one's father are usually used as surnames. So the children and grandchildren of Luma Wandem, an important orator and the colonial officer of Avatip and Manambo, the, all, they use, all, uh, all of them use the abbreviated version of his name, Luma, as the surname, which is why Pauline is called Pauline Luma, she was called. Then she became Lucky. Lucky is the name of her husband. And uh, uh, this surname is now Luma, is being passed on to further generations on identity cards, uh, birth certificates, other names have, are no longer known. So this nationalization of names has resulted in restricting the number of names someone has, loss of metric land names, and basically change in value. In addition, well, Pauline was called Pauline Lucky. Lucky is her husband's name. According to the Western practice, married women now really have to take their husband's name. A practice was really, well, as far as I know, it's frowned upon by some traditionally minded bearers. Look at this remarkable woman. Gaia Levine, she's passed away, Gaia for short. She introduced herself with her traditional Manambu name, then with a the chuckle, she said, well, now I am also Balangali because my husband is Balangali. This is only because she was sick and she had to register in the hospital. Otherwise she would never even would have thought of uh, uh, mentioning her husband's name. Uh, that was uh, uh, about 2013. And before that, um, she didn't talk about that. So things are getting like coral reef bleaching, just like everywhere in the world. We have endangered names. We can recall that even the Tarian of Northwest Amazonia have difficulties remembering their blessing names. As a result, they say, well, the treatment didn't work because he didn't know my real name. And the knowledge of the non phonemic names is in decline. Many uh, Manambu children and youngsters don't know their own names. They have to ask me or ask their mother. Now the mother is gone. Well, they ask me or their father really doesn't really know. And the name debates are held 
more and more rarely, last less, less than 30 years ago. Well, this is uh, also because the competent elders uh, pass, uh, pass away and the traditional initiation, even the sort of remainder of it is going. So uh, what about actually you could ask me avoidance of in-laws names. Uh, it's not a feature of the CPIC area, but the neighboring Enga province had it a lot. And now believe it or not, it's going because people are not afraid anymore. Why are they not afraid anymore? Because as missionary says, they have Jesus, which is great, but well, we see the erosion of culture, culture, the erosion of traditional things. You remember the queer names in traditional in the traditional Igbo culture. They are like prayers that certain deities and other social and super, supernatural powers agree to the survival and prosperity of their bearers. But as a result of colonial influence, the contemporary Igbo have abandoned most of the or virtually all queer names. If used at all, yeah, used as a kind of patronym, just like among the Manambo. And the same uh, 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 tendency was mentioned by another Igbo scholar. People lament uh, the loss of names, but they nothing they can do about it. So that's more or less what um, uh, Jane Hill, uh, the late Jane Hill, referred to as discourse of nostalgia, uh, uh, lamenting linguistic alienation of generations and whole groups, concomitant with the loss of tradition. What is being lost? Well, what is being lost, as it says here, uh, personal identity, history, and uh, uh, valuable belonging, belongings. So things are just not the same. We're faced with a very bleak picture, but it's not where I want to finish. What does the future hold? The resilience of names. Names do not die. They seem to be redeployed all over the place. Uh, I have witnessed, because I've been working with the Tarian like for 30 years now, uh, expansion of this field of use of blessing names in Amazonia, especially in email addresses and official introductions. Look at that. You remember this man, Rafael Brito, also known as Rafa, known as Tapia, is a nickname he doesn't like. His uh, uh, blessing name is Serev Hali, with an aspirated uh, glide. And he writes it. He's got his email address. Look at that. Serevali at gmail.com. He sends me messages, WhatsApp messages saying, I am Serevali, your younger brother. And it's like his identity mark. So he's introducing himself by, by using his blessing name. It wouldn't be possible 20, uh, 20 say 25 years ago. It would be strange, does it? Uh, so, and re this redeployment of names is something I have seen myself with regard to myself and other people. We had a Tariana language workshop, and in order to sort of make sure that Tariana people get food and others don't, because we didn't have enough, uh, we all get, uh, got these little name tags, and I obviously kept mine. It says Sasha in Brazilian Portuguese spelling, of course, Sasha Tariana Kumataro. So it gives my blessing name as my identity mark. Thank you, it's great. So you can look at it in this redeployment of names in two ways. You can say, oh, it's desacralization of names. Names are losing their sacred status and are acquiring another role and meaning. And so this sort of sacred and special force of it is lost, which of course is not true because we've seen Rosimar, who doesn't even speak Tariana, but he wants to know his name to be healthy. And so now he knows his name, he's healthy. And I talk to him now and again, he's fine. Or you can see it as a way of flaunting the names and keeping the knowledge going in whatever way. So, and of course here now, let's get back to the Oida. You remember that the young Oida was using his father's whistle name Moise as a ringtone for his mobile phone. And the Yalug, among the Yalugu people of the Sipic, Yalugu is very closely related to Manambu. They used to have these drum beats as a, an identifier of a clan or even a person. Now, they don't do that, but the name for drumbeat is used to refer to one's phone number. So phones play a most incredible role, but phones num a phone number is almost a unique identifier of a person. And the same word is used as the drumbeat. So it sort of shows you that they're not gone and maybe they'll continue. So uh, I'm almost finished. And the last question is, what can we as linguists kind of offer as a response to find the delicate balance between the encroaching modernization, which is probably fine, schooling, church, and so on, 
and the expansion of requirements of uh, nation state and the tradition. All we can do is documenting a language, languages, which is an open-ended task. Uh, languages, it's used by various speakers and various settings. Languages which are still spoken, work together with the community. And that may be instrumental in providing an open-ended documentation. The more we just record, document, put together, the few unanswered questions will come up in the future. And maybe lead by example as well. So these are some of the books where these things are documented. And uh, one of the highlights of my stay in Avatip at some point was my maternal uncle. Remember the importance of maternal relatives, uh, Paul, who came up to me. I, was, I really looked sick and I was sick. And all of a sudden he gave me an extra uh, matric clan name, uh, Bony Chicken. He said, well, you what here's a second name for. I just felt rich. And the youngsters were looking, oh my God, why is she so happy? Oh, this is why she's happy. So maybe they'll be happy too. And maybe they'll get one as well. So like the musical Phoenix, indigenous names probably will rise from the ashes, become something else. But anyway, they will be there. Something will be there. And here is a picture from the land of many names after the launch of the Manambu Grammar in Avatip in 2013. So you can see Pauline, you can see Paul, you probably can see me. And you can see uh, Kamimbao, the one who said that, ah, these people don't know how, this, how to uh, mourn properly. They are mourning in the men's way. <laughs> yes, and now all I can say is thank you, or in all these languages will be the same. And that's, of course, the encroaching influence of uh, uh, modernity, because there was no traditional way of saying thank you in uh, any of these languages. You just sort of nod, thank you. Thank you.